Hello and welcome to another video. Today we are going to have a look at why Ha Adam does not support the cult of queer theory uh, and the cult of queer theology. So obviously when I make these videos I'm speaking from the perspective of a believer and also someone who has an interest in scripture and in language itself. So please understand it from that context. Uh, even if you are an atheist, please try to understand the video from uh, the approach to the linguistic aspects that we are trying to make um, to address the claims being made by people who themselves profess to believe and who obviously show by their actions that they do not. So I shall begin with somewhat of a mild rant. And it sometimes just so happens that there are contents that are so abysmally blasphemous, so twisted, and based so solidly on falsehoods that it's quite difficult to even begin to unravel its absurdity. When making claims of a theological nature, especially when claiming to be a believer, scripture must be allowed to interpret scripture with the contents of the said verse understood via the context in which it was written, the historical period in which it was written, and also the culture that impacted on that language. Anything other than this is basically conjecture and pure speculation. I have to say it, it is just the musing of one's own personal imagination. It has no value. So, Let's orientate you a little bit, okay? Because I'm, obviously some people will know and some people will not. The Torah or Torah uh, means teaching law or instruction in Hebrew. And it's also part of the canonical Christian scriptures. It's comprised of the first five books as found in the Bible. It contains the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The common consensus is that they were written by the prophet Moses, and hence they are known as the Pentateuch, or the five books of Moses. At times, it's confused with the Tanakh, which is um, also known as the Mikra, and that is actually the complete Hebrew scriptures that also include the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. Uh, so sometimes when people talk about Torah, they are actually speaking about Tanakh. When understanding the Hebrew scriptures, we have to return to the understanding of the ancient Hebrew and Aramaic worldview, the context in which the scriptures were written, and then how they are taught at the time. We don't imagine our own new modern meaning based on errant philosophies, which would be counterproductive to understanding what sacred teachings are all about. So we have to go back to the origin. So what we're going to talk about in this video is uh, the claims made by a person called Liam Hooper. And these were claims made concerning the nature of Adam and Eve and are preposterous ideas based on queer theology and queer theory, which is in direct opposition to biblical truth. Liam Hooper uh, claims to make conversations around gender and intersectional power. So you have alarm bells going off already. She also calls God a false presence, thereby making him to be an impersonal or unknowable force. This is something that is different to what the Bible actually teaches. She states that she views the Torah, the Quran, and the New Testament or the Greek scriptures from the same perspective. Okay, so this is not just her, her Jewish worldview. Um, she was actually a Christian before, and then she went into this kind of line of Judaism, which is not even proper Judaism. Um, and it's clear that her ideas are not based 
on anything of scholarly validity. She also states that she does not view scripture as the literal word of God. You as an individual watching this may not have a problem with that. The problem is that if you claim to be a religious leader and you don't believe in what you are teaching, then why are you teaching it? Her beliefs are therefore even contrary to those um, in Judaism because she says that she does not believe that God spoke through the prophets at all, uh, which is different to what Second Samuel 23 verse 2 says, where King David literally wrote that God's spirit put the words on his tongue, so spoke through Holy Spirit. Further, in her claim, she says that she looks at scriptures as stories of people in a particular time and place who were searching to understand the divine, yet contradicts this by using queer theory, which did not exist at the time. So how do you use a theory that didn't exist at the time to explain what they were thinking? Unless, of course, you count the sordid abominations of Baal worship as queer theory, in which I guess that makes sense then in its own twisted way. Hooper states that she wants to be a queer poet and therefore read scripture as high intentionally crafted literature, which is to miss the whole point of what scripture is about. Most ironically, when she begins to explain scripture according to her interpretation, she warns that close reading is very important and that horrible things can happen when we don't read closely or when we do and then a decision is made to ignore what we find there. And then she does exactly that. In the entire video, she continues to ignore all the video, all the, all the evidence, I should say, that um, shows that she's creating an imaginary reading based on her own ideology and not on scripture, nor on Hebrew. Now, this is not meant to be a personal attack. This is meant to show what is not correct. And this is very much not correct. It is not my place to, to judge someone else. However, we must address these problems. So where do we begin? Well, in the beginning, she begins with an explanation of Genesis 2 verse 4 to 8 and Genesis 2 verse 18 to 22, as if independent of Genesis 1. Now, this is a really extremely elementary mistake when it comes to understanding verses. Why? Now, I'm going to tell you some things which is very basic knowledge to anyone who's done any scholarly look at, at the Bible, okay? Uh, or anyone who actually just reads the Bible, let's put it that way. Modern chapters and verses were not used in ancient times. In fact, they're a very recent development compared to the whole history. The ancient Hebrews divided their holy writings uh, using paragraphs which were marked by the two Hebrew letters, Pe, which means open, and then Samech, which indicated a close of a paragraph. And then they begin the same line after a small space. The Torah was divided into 154 sections in Israel and into 53 or 54 sections by the Jewish diaspora in Babylonia. And the divisions were made to make it easier to handle scrolls, which were really quite bulky and they could get quite heavy. The scroll of Isaiah, for example, is a really huge, long scroll. Um, it does exist in one piece. However, for everyday type of reading, you would want to divide that to make it much easier. Modern chapter divisions of the Bible are based on the system developed by Archbishop Stephen Langton in the 13th century. And then in the 1557, William Whittingham published the first English Bible in which verse divisions were found. And then in 1560, the Geneva Bible used both chapters and ver uh, verses, which became the standard for what we use today to quickly reference it. 
So why am I giving you this background information? Well, think back to the previous elementary mistake. Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 of Genesis were not originally divided. Okay, They continue on to provide the entire context of the same account. Okay, So it's one piece of writing. We've divided them into 1 and 2 now, but they weren't originally. Chapter 1 tells the order in which things took place during the creative process. And then in Chapter 2, the account of how things took place in Chapter 1 is recorded. So in reality, one cannot interpret Chapter 2 without basing all contextual knowledge on Chapter 1. Okay, You don't have one step. You don't have a, like a second step without one step. Steps go in a process. But basically what's happening here is you're removing the bottom step and then just having the second step way up there. It doesn't make sense. So one cannot interpret chapter two without basing all contextual knowledge on chapter one. But Hooper interprets chapter two separately from chapter one because chapter one invalidates her ideology and thus it's a willful exclusion of the fact. When explaining the meaning of the man in and Adam, um, Hooper claims that et or eth in Hebrew means the definite article. Um, ha, so she means that the, the et means that the Hebrew article ha is coming up, and so that the text is almost saying the the. That's her claim. But this statement is in of itself completely erroneous. Hebrew actually does not have a freestanding word for the or a definite article. It's always as part of a conjugation, as a prefix, et, translated into English, the, and it can actually also mean this. It's possible that ha entered into Hebrew from Aramaic or possibly during captivity in Babylonia based on the Babylonian word for the or this, anu'um, but regardless of its origins, the ha prefect acts to orientate the reader towards the article being spoken about, which in this case is the noun man, hadam. This differentiates adam, which simply means mankind, and which appears without the definite prefix ha from the actual individual human ha-adam, that was created and which appears with the definite article ha. What about the et? Well, et doesn't really have any equivalent in English because Hebrew is not English. So et is a direct object marker in the accusative case, which has no equivalent in English. It does not mean the regardless of what Hooper claims. It functions to tell the reader that the object which follows is the object to which a certain action is being done or to which something is taking place. So, for example, um, if we look at Genesis 127, So we'll just read Genesis 1, verse 27. So it says, Wayibra Elohim et ha Adam, Basalmo Baselem Elohim bara etal, Zahar unekeba bara otam. All right. So let's look at how it goes together. Wayibra, so created, Elohim, God, uh, et. Now, here we have this direct object marker. What is it telling us? It's telling us that the previous one here, Elohim, God, is doing this action. To who? It says here, Ha-Adam, the man. So, God is doing the action to the man. Basalmo, uh in his own image, in the image of um Elohim. Bara he created Etohim Zachar male 
Okay, this word is used for, for even animals, male animals. Unukreba and female, Bara, he created or tam, them. So it shows that there were two individuals that were created. All right. Uh, okay. So this goes contrary to her claims that Ha'adam is some sort of gender statement and that Adam was a genderless being or that Adam was intersex. Hooper then claims that the text in chapter 2 is not speaking of the creation of the first man and woman, but rather the creation of relationships, as she calls it, which doesn't make sense. It can't be a claim of making relationships and then also the claim for a gender or sex creation. Can this really be true, what she's saying, the creation of relationships? Well, remember, chapter 1 and 2 cannot be interpreted separately. So why is she so adamant to exclude chapter 1? Well, her argument falls to pieces when considering Genesis 1, 27, which not only uses Ha'adam, but also distinctly explains exactly which two sexes were created. It says that God created the first human couple, not as some vague genderless humanoids, but as male Zachar and as female Nekreba. Zachar appears in scripture 82 times, and it only ever means a male or is even applied to animals to mean a male animals. Nekreba, Nekreba, sorry, appears 22 times and it only ever means females. It also means a female animal. No reading about an implied gender identity can be ascribed to these words, either linguistically or based on any kind of historical evidence. It just doesn't exist. Her understanding of the order of events in which things take place is also erroneous. This even goes against science. Okay, so she states essentially that Adam was created and then God creates creatures, animals to bring to him, to name them. But because Adam is not able to build a relationship with these animals, that God then creates a gender assignment by creating Eve. The Bible clearly states that animals were created before humans and all species of plants existed before humans, something that is verified by the fossil record. So whether it's the Bible or whether it's science, they're both agreeing on this point that animals became before humans. So Hooper claims that Adam was androgynous and that gender was created via the first gender assignment surgery, which created Eve. At no point does she give any biblical evidence to support this. It's literally her imagination. Hooper claims that the current understanding of Genesis is misogynistic and sexist. The beauty of Genesis 2:20 to 23 are both symbolic and on a scientific level is completely missed. Eve is created not as an inferior specimen. She is not merely a weak man. She is an entirely new creation. Her genetics may share a common origin with Adam, but the scriptures make it clear that she is something unique. Verse 20 calls Eve a helper, Ezer. In ancient Hebrew culture, this is not considered an inferior position, but rather one of equality because a helper is one who works together with or one that aids in a work. Thus God dignifies Eve by giving her a complementary position, which is further emphasized by the process of her creation. Whereas Adam is created from the dust of the earth, Eve is created in a completely different process. God puts Adam into a deep sleep. Tardema. Here, used to describe a state of general anesthesia where Adam would not have been conscious of pain. God proceeds to take a rib, Sela. On a side note, actually, the Hebrew word for rib is a feminine noun, 
So that's just funny. You should know that. Um, this is actually highly practical as well as symbolic. If you look at it on a scriptural side and if you look at it on a scientific side. Now, the rib can be removed without disabling a person. It contains stem cells that can be engineered into something new with significantly more ease. In this case, a female. But the rib is also a covering to the heart. In ancient cultures, this refers to the seed of affection and love, much like it does in, in modern sense of the word. So the word rib, sela, can also refer to the side. Once again, also symbolic in this case, it can be taken literally alongside with symbolically, emphasizing that a woman was to work side by side with a man, and she wasn't to be treated as something that's inferior. In fact, she was meant to be loved by the man. What then does Genesis 1.26 mean when speaking about creating humans in God's image? Well, to understand this, um, one must try to fathom the nature of God, which while not possible in, in whole, is possible to conceptualize through hints given in scripture. God is, for example, not bound by the constraints of DNA, since he exists outside of what humans understand the universe to be. 1 Kings 8, 27. Nor is he affected by time, nor does he perceive time in the same manner as humans. 2 Peter 3, 8. And he remains constant and unchanging. Malachi 3, 6. Now, God is a being of spirit, a state of existence we can't even fathom or fully comprehend, and where things such as sex and gender are not even applicable. Yet, should we not refer to God as he wishes us to refer to him? Are we to incite God to jealousy, as 1 Corinthians 10.22 says? <coughs> Excuse me. By referring to him by the stipulations of a corrupt and a based man-made philosophy such as gender theory that would force pronouns on him that he has not chosen. So what pronouns has God chosen? Well, Deuteronomy explains both his personal name that he chose and the masculinity which he has chosen to be understood with. Now, Deuteronomy 20 verse 6 says, I am Yahweh, your God. Now, the tetragrammaton, in the four letters is God's most personal uh, most sacred personal name. It's written as Yahweh, Yehovah, uh, but it's often anglicized as Jehovah. And it's a proper noun. More importantly, it's a singular noun. And your God is rendered as Elohecha, which is the compound form of Elohim. And it's a second person, personal, masculine, singular. So being made in God's image and his likeness of God must have a different meaning other than an anthropological description. Because women are also referred to in the same context as being made in God's image. So when referring to the image of God in Colossians 3 verse 10, the Apostle Paul uses the very same Greek word for image as found in the Septuagint version of Genesis 1 verse 26. And he says, Clothe yourselves with a new personality, which through accurate knowledge is being made new according to the image of the one who created it. So rather than being a physical manifestation, being made in the image of God refers to the capacity and ability to reflect divine qualities such as love and kindness based on knowledge, qualities which animals are not imbued with. Animals can be affectionate but they cannot love in the same way as the humans love deeply. This is in line with Deuteronomy 6.5, which states, you must love Jehovah your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. So the divine capacity for love is therefore the greatest gift and reflection of God's image. But confusion arises because the fact that God is love is twisted by religious leaders to say that he will permit anything and that he will not judge those who break regulations. This is a falsehood, as shown in Proverbs 3, verse 11 to 12. It says, My son, do not reject the discipline of Jehovah, and do not loathe his reproof. For those whom Jehovah loves, he reproves, just as a father does a son in whom he delights. Divine approval 
And the requirement for receiving God's love is therefore submitting to him, repenting, which means to turn away from a bad course, and restraining oneself in self-discipline. All concepts that are the actual polar opposite to the anything-goes attitude preached by queer and gender theory adherents, who have apostatized both from actual Judaism and from Christianity in teaching what is contrary to Scripture. Indeed, God directly rebukes such things as cross-dressing in Deuteronomy 22 verse 5, noting how it causes corruption and that it is an abomination. So in short, there can be no consolidation between biblical theology and queer theology, just as one cannot partake from the table of God and the table of demons as recorded in 1 Corinthians 10.21. The scriptures aptly describe them as follows. Such men are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself keeps transforming himself into an angel of light. It is therefore nothing great if his ministers also keep transforming themselves into ministers of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 5.